Story 1. I started dating a girl about seven years ago. When we met, she was getting on her feet and trying to find her way in life. I let my imagination take over and started envisioning her potential and what kind of life we would have together. I had never had the feeling of disarm, punch-drunk love that I had for her, and that probably clouded my judgment. Throughout our time together, she would reach out and ask for money for things like repairing a car, paying a bill, etc. We were getting closer the longer we dated, and I would always help her, assuming that I was making an investment in both of our lives by helping her through a period of instability. In all, I probably gave her about $15,000. After about four years of this, I finally popped the question. She accepted, and we were married after a brief engagement. About six months into our marriage, she told me she had been having car trouble and needed about $2,000 for the repair. This struck me as a bit odd. By that time, I was more than familiar with her vehicle and knew her explanation for what the issue was didn't make sense. One evening after she went to sleep, I went and had a look at the part of the car she had said was faulty. No issue. This set off alarms. I grabbed her phone and, on a hunch, typed in the amount she had asked for, and it returned a text message with a guy she had previously dated. Apparently, he had reached out and asked for help repairing his car, and lo and behold, he had asked for the same amount she had requested from me. My stomach turned as the thought entered my mind that maybe I had subsidized other of this guy's expenses across the time I had dated my wife. As I read through the messages further, I realized that this guy was like Lester Diamond to my Sam Rothstein, and I had been played like a fool. Look up that reference if you're not familiar. I had spent my entire relationship as a bank account for them. I thought about this for a few weeks and tried to figure out what to do next. These sacrifices were not insignificant to me. I had been working as a surgical resident for much of our courtship, making very little money and working long hours to form a strong, solid foundation for our future. This was devastating, and I realized that I couldn't reconcile the situation. Once I had cooled down, I waited for an evening when my wife went to bed early, and I got into her phone. I caught up on the most recent messages she and her paramour had sent one another. Then I initiated a conversation with him. I posed as her and told him she had been drinking she is a recovering alcoholic and that she needed to get some things off her chest. I didn't go overboard, but I did send messages to the effect that she was not over him and that her affections had grown since marrying me. I all but teed him up to move in for a relationship with her. I then abruptly ended the chat and asked that we not talk about the conversation again to avoid furthering her relapse, but that we both keep in mind what we had spoken about and see if we could make a life together work. I then deleted the text from her phone and hoped the two would proceed forward together. They did. I kept an eye on the text for the next few months and progressively saw things heat up between them until it looked like she was committed to leaving me. We didn't have many assets together at the time as I was still finishing a surgical residency. So I knew the divorce would be quick and painless and that we would go our separate ways and she would start a new life with the guy whose underachievements I had been funding. So I filed for divorce and had her serve papers. I was generous with the $10,000 in assets between us to make the split as quick as possible and went on our ways to begin life anew. And you'd think that is the end of the story, right? Oh no, friend, you see, mama didn't raise a fool. In our state, not only are assets separated upon marital severance, but so are debts. And medical school is very expensive, really expensive, a quarter of a million dollars expensive. So, she ended up with a parting gift of about $125,000 of my student loans. And guess who she quickly married two months after our divorce? Fortunately for her, she'll only have to pay half of that amount, because if history does indeed repeat itself, he'll be paying the other half once their marriage ends as well. It was all I could do to not send them a piggy bank as a wedding gift. Best $15,000 I ever spent. Story 2 I am so lucky to live in a small four-level apartment building with 26 flats in it and half that many parking spots, so not everyone gets a parking space. One apartment a childless couple somehow took two spaces, with the cherry on top that our building is just across a restaurant with merely four or five parking spots for three times that many tables. I came home one evening to see a car with a license plate from a city 100 kilometers away far for us in my spot, unknown to me. So it wasn't a neighbor that renewed his ride and didn't yet transfer it. Annoyed by this, because it became really common lately, I saw that the parking lot was full. 
because my spot is at the end. It has a triangular half spot just beside it and a wall that was dedicated for a motorcycle, but unused since I sold my Transalp I'm a Honda fan, with cars to a year ago. So I parked my car at a 90 degree angle behind him, all the way to the wall, so that I wouldn't annoy other neighbors trying to get out, nor leave my car on the street, which my wife did six years ago and her car was stolen. But that didn't clear the imposing car completely. So to get out, Hesh needed to call me or be very precise in squeezing between the back of my car and the neighbor's car. Hesh chose neither. Maybe 20-30 minutes later, someone rang my bell, and it's my next door slash parking spot neighbor, telling me to get down fast because the owner of the car is calling the cops, after he told him he'd help him steer through or call me to move my car first. So clearly an inconsiderate move, to which I reacted promptly and got out in just a few minutes. Alas, a few minutes too late because the cops were already there and writing me a ticket on my building's private parking lot for my parking spot. It got out of hand pretty quickly because I'm short-tempered and the cop just seemed to have something against me. Of course, I wasn't that naive to not know that I made it hard for Himmer to get out, but I tried telling the cop that they were in a private parking space of a private apartment building, to which he just said, your ticket is almost done, sign below. I was having none of it, so I asked him to. If he already gave me a ticket 43 euros approx, if you pay promptly, it's half that. Issue one to the offending vehicle for improper parking, to which the inconsiderate cop had the nerve to say, prove that it's yours. Now my wife owns our apartment, so there is no lease on it that says specifically, parking place number seven right up to the wall is assigned to the number 18 flat. But we made all the signs necessary for a parking lot and put no parking signs on them of course excluding residents and had that metal thingy direct translation would be a frog because when you push it up it raises and becomes a triangular barrier over which you can't park but mine was broken and couldn't be raised this was very fishy but i couldn't do anything about it because in the eyes of the law i did partially obstruct his vehicle which is a no-no and had no proof that spot belonged to me but this is the time when my more easygoing and calmer spouse noticed that the cop smelled of alcohol. Now I don't drink alcohol, so I would have, if I wasn't so angry, smelled it too before but didn't. And when she pointed that out, I realized a heavy beer smell coming from him. A cop on duty. Even bigger no-no. We tried warning him that we'd call the regular police over here. There are many types of police. Traffic. Criminal. Special militarized police. Etc. In the hope they'd let this go. I'd move for him to get out and take my spot, but to no avail. He claimed we were imagining the smell, asked me to sign, and if I had any objections, I could go to a judge and complain, and they needed to leave. Of course, I wanted proof for said judge because I wanted to confront him and wanted to call the criminal police on them for being intoxicated on the job and while driving to my place and back, so I pulled out my phone to take a picture, to which he stepped in front of me and tried to ban me from doing so, saying, you can't take pictures of his car. What on earth, man? Who is he if you're giving me so much trouble and acting so mean? All this commotion drew my neighbors out. They all explained that we alone can park there and the restaurant can deal with it along with its guests more politely than that. When my wife came down, she took our daughters with her, a two-year-old and a seven-year-old. The older one thought they came to arrest me. The police have a scary reputation in. These parts, a communist era leftover, when she started crying, the toddler also did because her sister was crying. A mess I wanted to end. So I had to think fast. A light bulb lit, and I told him, I won't take pictures of him, her, or their car. I need a picture of my spot occupied illegally for the judge nailed you, inconsiderate person. He thought about it for a second and moved. So I did use my phone to take two images. And karma arrived finally, just as I took my images using flash right behind their car. In a dark parking lot, stopped and sat down on the stairs. The inconsiderate person that already started the car while I was taking pictures, obviously annoyed by the fuss me and my neighbors made, tried to speed away in reverse from our parking lot. And guess what happens if you do that in a parking lot with parallel parking spots and just five meters between them and a large Audi estate car? Yes, you hit a car parked across. Now I got up and just calmly said, now you can issue them a ticket and make a report. And guess what the cop had to say to that? You think he took out his ticket book again? Nope. Someone get the owner of the car so they can work it out. So we can leave. What on earth, man? Guess what the inconsiderate person said hearing that. He was blinding me with some strong light while I unparked. He's to blame. What on earth?
I took two images before you even had it in gear, got back to the stairs, and sat down? Of course, my annoyed neighbors did what the cop asked. It was getting late, and guess why else? The neighbor whose Audi she hit was a huge jerk to everyone, didn't speak with 90% of the building, so we all couldn't wait for him to get out. I took my ticket, paid the obligatory half, took my crying kids upstairs, got out on our bedroom terrace, and yelled to those inconsiderate people a phrase similar to, what goes around, comes around, with a smile, and left them to work it out. In the end, they paid almost three times more for the inconsiderate person's bumper than I did, which I learned days later when a neighbor told me that along with her, you know the judge that was here for a celebration in the restaurant and took your spot. So that's why the cop acted like a jerk. Oh well, he got to enjoy a three-month suspension for drinking on the job for his effort. Story 3 My homeowners association was fairly reasonable as homeowners associations go, at least until we got a new management company owned and operated by a guy we shall call D.N., short for douche nozzle. My first run-in with D.N. was when I asked him why he was sending photographers around at the crack of dawn on Fridays, when our recycle day is Thursday night. They would take pictures of cans still out from the last night's trash and try to find you for it without giving you until after sunrise to bring it up. This isn't just me. A bunch of neighbors in our neighborhood social media groups complained about the can police, dumb landscaping write-ups, the usual. So a couple of springs ago, I got a notice letter that my side of the wood fence adjoining a neighbor's yard was out of compliance and needed staining. Friends, it needed staining because there are three 20-foot tall trees in front of it and the branches rub on it all day. You never see the fence once the trees are leafed out, and the only reason you could see them this particular spring is that we had a late freeze. So Team DN sends me a complaint letter. I officially disputed with photos of my neighbor's fences in similar condition, albeit without the tree rubbing, arguing that I was being singled out. I'm not a monster. I got the neighbor's permission first. DN personally comes out on appeal to visually inspect my fence, rejects my dispute, and tells me that he can't give me specifics of letters to neighbors regarding their fences due to privacy, but that it's being handled. I then scoured our homeowners association documents and formulated my malicious compliance. Here's where DN messed up. Our homeowners association has rigorous standards for external paint and trim, front yard trees, and landscaping. However, the only guidance they provide on fences is that the color must be a visually appealing which is not defined and therefore totally subjective and difficult to enforce and be coordinate with adjacent fences. No specific colors are given, nor is there a maximum amount of allowable colors per fence. However, the whole neighborhood 100 plus homes has deep red or brown stains on wood fences and all metal fences are black. I once again disputed the notice to DN citing our homeowners association documents, arguing that since all adjacent fences were weathered and the stain was worn, I had nothing to match to. I sent this on a Thursday night, hoping that he would see it on Friday, BB headed out for his weekend, and C not really think through a response before hitting send. And oh boy, the universe provided. He sent a quick, flippant reply Friday stating that the neighbors would have to coordinate with me. I needed to have the issue remediate within a couple of weeks to avoid a fine, per our homeowners association covenants. Sir. Yes, sir. I told him I was proceeding immediately and would be sure to comply with our governing documents. So that very day, I called three four stain companies. A couple came out over the weekend to give me quotes. This was while things were still slow from the pandemic. After running the numbers, my wife and I realized that painting every picket a different color on 200 feet of fence would be cost prohibitive. So we settled on the grossest shade of bright blue we could find. Smurfalicious. After the work was done early the next week, I took a picture of my masterpiece and sent it to DN with a note that said, I trust this resolves our issue. Not a word since. The neighbors eventually stained their fences too. And to be honest, they did a really bad job of coordinating with our color but I'll leave that to the Homeowners Association to address.